Okay, next up, we have Steve Cretenden. Uh, Steve is a soil scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Steve has been a research scientist in soil health and nutrient management at Ag and Agri-Food Canada in Brandon, MB, since 2017. His research aim is to maintain or increase productivity while ensuring the long-term environmental sustainability of agricultural systems through soil health and soil fertility management. Steve manages the plant and soil nutrient analysis lab at AAFC Brandon, sits on the local regional committees focused on soil fertility, and is the, is the soils lead for the Eastern Prairies Living Laboratory and is the local champion for the Canada-wide Indigenous Student Recruitment Initiative. Let's welcome Steve Cretenden. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah, thanks. So our, oh yeah, mic's on, okay. Yeah, so thanks for uh, coming, sticking around after the uh, most esteemed panel that was uh, before me. Um, so what I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, some updates on some ongoing uh, projects we have, uh, focused on soil health, as well as um, some more agro agronomic studies that we are linking to um, air and uh, water quality. So there's the, uh, the outline. The soil health uh, work that we have is about um, adapting, using soil health as a tool to understand uh, how to compare our management systems to find ones which are going to give us the best resilience to extreme weather, so climate change. Uh, so that's sort of the first half of the, uh, of the talk. The second half is uh, a little bit more agronomic, as I mentioned. So there's my contact information. I thought I'd get that out there uh, right at the beginning. So uh, you can email me, uh, stephen.crittenden at canada.stay, C-A, or um, uh, my Twitter handle is there as well. So I thought first just to mention that um, the uh, research is, is really difficult to do. Uh, and to do it, we ha need a lot of people to uh, work with, to collaborate with. So um, I listed some of the um, AFC scientists that um, have contributed to the data that I'm going to show today, um, as well as the uh, technical staff, our uh, people on the ground who are uh, doing the sampling, running the trials for us. Um, I wanted to thank CMCDC staff. I see you guys there not paying any attention. Um, and as well as to uh, note who's uh, paying for the research. Most of the data is uh, funded through AFC directly. But uh, producer groups have chipped in as well for very specific uh, projects, and I'll mention those as I, as I go along. I'm fascinated by this slide. Did you know that soil has just been redefined? I, I find that such a odd, uh, an odd occurrence that uh, in 2017, the um, Soil Science Society of America uh, published a new updated definition of what soil is, you know, something that's so fundamental to everything that we do uh, uh, has been redefined. So this is, this is the uh, current um, definition of what soil is. Um, so you can read it there, but it has, um, it's logical for the most, most part, has mineral components, organic material components, has physical, chemical, and biological components. I, that's important uh, when we talk about soil health. Those processes are going on there. Um, at or near the planetary surface. And uh, part of the reason that they updated the definition is because when they um, are sending probes to Mars and they want to explore the, um, uh, the solar system, um, they need to define what that material is which is on those, those planets. So that's that was part of the impetus for redefining um, what soil is. Soil health, on the other hand, is... Um, I know there's a, there's a lot of buzz around soil health. Uh, to boil it, try and boil it down for you, it's everything that's going on in the soil. It's those interactions of the um, chemical components, the biological components, the physical components. So I'd like you to keep that in mind when you're hearing about uh, this new soil health test or you improve this specific biological component of soil and that's going to solve all your issues. It's not going to solve all your issues. Um, but I think if we are moving towards 
uh, a way of thinking which includes all of those things. If you're, you're changing, you want to change your management and you think about uh, what's it going to do to the chemistry there? What's it going to do to the biology? What's it going to do to the uh, soil structure, water movement? Uh, I think that's moving us in the right, in the right direction. So, of course, soil health, generally, when we talk about soil health, we have a goal in mind. So we want to improve our uh, yield, our production. But I just wanted to comment really briefly that soils are important for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which uh, soil is the largest carbon sink in the world. Um, so we're, we're, house, we're, we're keeping carbon in our soils, we're cycling nutrients through our soils, um, Plants, animals, microorganisms live in soils. Water is filtered through our soils, our drinking water, so regulating um, groundwater uh, uh, streams and water bodies. So as we're making decisions, I think that's important to keep in mind. So we, we want to talk about uh, soil health in a changing climate. Um, so what, what are the predictions for climate change for uh, Canada, broadly speaking? Um, I don't know if you can read all this, but basically we're imagining that conditions will be warmer, that they'll be drier or wetter, isn't that contradictory, right? Longer periods of, dry, of drought with, uh, with sporadic heavy rainfall events, um, so more extremes. More CO2, so there are um, positive impacts, maybe that uh, allows us to grow might improve yields in some cases. Maybe we can grow some new crops, but there are negative impacts from that as well, we imagine. Um, pests and diseases, soil erosion, uh, moisture stress. So the net effect is a lot more uncertainty. So how do you plan for more uncertainty? How do you plan your farming strategies, what, your, your, your cropping systems, your tillage systems, your soil fertility? Um, that is a big question. Um, that doesn't have an answer, but uh, part of the ongoing work that we're doing now is trying to identify some management practices, at least, you know, you have to start small and, and work your way up, identifying management practices which, which would give your system a better resilience to those stresses. So one way of doing it is uh, computer modeling. There's been work on that. I wanted to try and uh, stress, water stress, these cropping systems in the field to try and get more closely to what um, uh, producers are going to find on their farms. And another important uh, component of what we're doing, so we are uh, trying to improve soil health for our, to meet our yield goals, of course, but we're also um, taking into account um, some of the negative, the trade-offs. So we're, we're also measuring greenhouse gas emissions and, and 2O specifically. So this is um, a table uh, from uh, Sydney Grant and Don Flayton um, with uh, Stats Canada data that um, shows us that this is um, these are the uh, prairie provinces. This is through time. It's the uh, uh, percentage of land prepared for seeding in various tillage systems. So if you look at Manitoba, the most recent one, 41% of uh, seeded land was conventionally tilled, 39% uh, conservation and 20%, only 20% no-till. So that tells me that there's still a question about tillage um, in Manitoba. So these are the um, instruments that we use to, um, to prepare our plots at the uh, Carberry uh, uh, Research Farm. <clears throat> we had two rotations, uh, basically comparing wheat and corn in uh, canola soy comparison. Uh, each of those crops were present in the first two years. This is only two years. Um, and then what I wanted to do, as I, as I mentioned, for what we imagine is going to happen in, in climate change, I wanted to um, put water stress onto the, those crops. So we did um, an extreme rainfall event in the first two years. These are the, the sprinklers that we use there in a, a, a nice sunset. So um, one of my favorite uh, soil health components, and I think an often um, taken for granted one, are those physical aspects. So um, we're expecting shifts in our water, when uh, water regimes, our precipitation patterns uh, with climate change. And so what I thought to do <clears throat> first was to look at how water is moving through soil in these systems. 
So that depends on, of course it depends on the weather, but you can't change that. Um, you can manage your soil structure. Uh, so that's the, the organization of the aggregates and the organization of the pore spaces within your soil um, and the uh, organic matter content and the soil texture, of course. So that's clay and, and sand. So tillage on the short term influences that structure directly. On the longer term, your inputs from uh, your carbon inputs from the rotation, from the residue, um, and also from the tillage systems um, should have a longer term impact on soil structure and functions. So just, I thought I would try and visualize um, what soil structure looks like and how water moves through soil. That's a difficult thing to do. But so what we did here, this is a, it's called a double ring infiltrometer. What we did was we put uh, water in the middle, we put a blue dye, it's called brilliant blue dye. We put that in the middle, you let that water infiltrate. And then what you do is you uh, make a cross section, you cut down the middle. And so that's what it looks like. I hope you can see blue. This is at the top, those red lines. That's where that uh, ring for the, from the infiltrometer was. So it's really blue right where we were putting the dye in, of course. And then right at the, the, where the ring ends, you'll see there's quite a bit of blue that goes down, right? This is what you imagine is going to happen. But there's quite a bit of blue, if, I hope you can see. There's a lot of blue off to the sides as well. And then as you go down farther, there's blue that pops out in sort of like seemingly random places. But though, that's because uh, water flow through pores in soil is extremely com complex. It's moving, it's, it's, it's uh, meandering through the soil through the path of least resistance. So this is, um, I wanted to just stress how important infiltration is, how complex that system is, and that um, compaction is extremely um, important to avoid because it takes, it, it, it closes those pores, reduces aeration, uh, slows root penetration, and it's extremely slow to, um, to recuperate from. So I wonder, those of you that didn't get your fertilizers on last fall, um, I guess I would recommend taking care in the spring that it's not too wet when you get out there. So these are some of our infiltration uh, data from that field. We, um, where we applied uh, 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 the heavy rainfall event. So um, on the short term, your tillage system, you're loosening, you're uh, increasing the porosity. And so you see in those red bars in the, um, in the canola system, the corn, the soybean, and the wheat, <clears throat> for the most part, where we loosened the soil, infiltration uh, water went in faster. That's what that graph's telling you. So on the long term, that no-till, you're hoping that the soil bio biological activity is going to recuperate that porosity, but that takes time. So this is what I expected to see on the short term. This, again, this is only the second year of this study. We're also looking at the ability of the soil to hold water. So this is, um, you're hoping that in drought, that you can, ma you can manage your system in a way to improve the ability of the soil to hold water when there's drought. But think about those two things. We, we, we lump them together a lot, but they're completely opposite functions, things that we need our soil to do. We need it to infiltrate fast when it rains a lot. We need it to hold water when it's dry. I mean, those are opposites, right? Uh, and it's, would be, it's very slow to improve this soil water retention. Um, and so that's why... I'll just skip over it. Basically, there were no differences on the very short term there. But hopefully, as we move forward, we will see some treatment differences. As I mentioned, um, we're also measuring greenhouse gases uh, as a sort of a trade-off um, for, for trying to reach our soil health goals. <coughs> so this is the, um, the chamber that we use in the field. You uh, stick it in the soil, you cap it, you isolate that um, the gases that are em being emitted from the soil. You take a sample and you bring it back to the fancy gas chromatograph in the lab and you measure the data. So these are um, some really blurry lines. This is last year's data. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that, yes, we did see um, that the heavy rainfall event increased the greenhouse gas emissions, but in truth, the early season moisture content, the legacy nitri nitrogen, which was there in the spring, uh, really overwhelmed everything. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing uh, story. Here's some of the yield data. I know this is embarrassing for canola yields. We had seeding problems, we had flea beetles, we had weed problems. Um, 
And so I wonder, I think that when we, uh, we put the rainfall on, we were just probably feeding the weeds, in truth. <clears throat> the wheat data from 2019 um, is maybe a bit more respectable. We saw uh, a significant improvement where we added rainfall. Um, I wonder if um, the timing of our heavy rainfall event, which was, by the way, a 100-year rainfall event, it was uh, three inches a day for three days, so nine inches, 150 millimeters. And I wonder if just the, the timing of that rainfall uh, was just good for the, uh, just matched up with the need of the wheat, whereas we saw no treatment effect in the corn. And now flipping now to the soybeans, we saw the opposite uh, effect where um, I was imagining that soybeans would respond well to this, this moisture, but not in our first year. So we had, where we applied extra rain, we decreased yield <clears throat> in this case. So we did one other thing. Um, these are these, uh, we call them rain out shelters. They uh, keep rainfall off of the, of the field. We, so trying to get those two extremes, heavy rainfall and a drought. So we, did, we only managed to do this in the soybeans in the first year. <clears throat> and so the drought reduced the soybean yield uh, in 2019. So soybeans, <laughs> uh, poor soybeans were pretty sensitive to the moisture extremes. Again, this is just one year of data, so check back in future. Um, so what do we want to do with all of these data? We're also uh, measuring nutrient dynamics along with the water and the, and the um, various soil health uh, indicators. We want to build a useful tool for producers for Manitoba. Um, and this, um, this set of rings is uh, the process that you go through. Basically, you measure as many interesting um, or soil health parameters, traditional ones and untraditional ones, that you think might be interesting. And you sort of whittle away the ones which you found, which you found are not interesting, are not useful as predictors or to be able to uh, distinguish between cropping systems. And then you get down to a minimum data set um, of indicators, things that you can measure, which allow you to differentiate through time on your farm, uh, compare between places on fields, <clears throat> and between management systems. So that's something that we're hoping to do um, for Manitoba. So now I'm moving on to some of the uh, more agronomic work that we're doing within the context of the uh, four hour nutrient stewardship. <clears throat> so I know you know this, right source, right rate, time, place. But that's relative, that's context dependent, what is right? Um, and there comes in, I hope, some of our uh, research and of course those of the colleagues. So um, I, I've taken what placement means to be a little bit, a little bit broadly. This data set, this is a really nice little data set. Um, Byron Irvin was here earlier. I don't know if he's still here, but he uh, organized this along with John Fitzmaurice. <coughs> Basically, we wanted to know if uh, areas of fields which are driven over more than once, uh, what are the nutrients that are left there? Is the efficiency lower in those areas? So we sampled um, 80, 81 farms, <coughs> over 1,000 soil samples, uh, a few years back in the Prairie Provinces. And we're calling that overlap. Is it overlapped or is it not overlapped? So just to show you uh, what we mean when we say overlap, I guess you can imagine what your field looks like. That's a, that's a hydro pole. So you can see the lines, the driving patterns there that they clearly had to drive over certain parts more than once. Your field shape, I guess, I used to think the prairies were just full of boxes, uniform everywhere, but it's clearly not, not the case. So maybe just because of, this is a water course here, <clears throat> because of the field shape, I think, again, you can see the patterns of the driving. They've had to drive over more than once. And of course, the um, typical prairie pothole um, landscape, um, those are, um, yeah, another reason why you have to drive over certain, you overlap certain areas. So we, we did have separate those data into those three types, but it showed the same pattern. So I put it just in one table for you. So we measured soil organic matter, nitrate, Olson P, clay content, and pH. <coughs> And we did that at um, 
6 inches, down to 12 inches, and down to 24 inches. So no difference in either soil organic matter or clay content. And so that makes me think that inherently what's going on in the soil is the same between the overlap and the non-overlap. But look at, all the, look at the nitrate which is left in that overlap area. Zero to six inches, 10 pounds per acre more. Six to 12 inches, eight pounds per acre more. And down to 24 inches, 18 pounds per acre more nitrate left in those overlap areas that they had to drive over more than once. So you put that all together, that's a lot of nitrogen that's left there, unused. Ready for, le oh, and I wanted to say, clearly there's more down at the bottom, so it's leaching uh, downwards. Um, same pattern with uh, Olsen phosphate, phosphorus, um, a smaller effect, but still significant when we ran the stats. And just to highlight this, this is 81 farms across three prairie provinces. There's a lot of variability you can imagine. Um, so I, I was quite surprised that we were able to find these effects given all of that variability. Um, and then interestingly as well, uh, a pH effect, uh, higher pH in the overlap areas. I mean, maybe that's from extra liming. So, okay, so uh, this is observational data, right? We didn't change anything. We just went to these farms and we observed what was going on. So, so I can't tell you that uh, this is because the fertilizer was being applied twice in those overlap areas. But I guess you know what you do on your farm if you fertilize more than once in a spot. I mean, if that's not the case, it could be something uh, inherent about those areas which um, lowers the uptake of nutrients and in those plants and leaves more there. Maybe salt, maybe compaction, we don't know. But uh, I guess the moral of that story is um, if you can, try to take care in those overlap areas because there's tending to be a lot of nutrients left over there. So um, really briefly into uh, some of the agronomic work. It's these two studies on wheat and canola are both ongoing. So I'm not going to draw any conclusions from them, but just to say that <coughs> I planted the question earlier to John. Um, on one hand, trying to understand um, nutrient use efficiency and availability of nutrients in our um, Manitoba growing conditions, but also to, um, I mean, new varieties are released every year but the recommendations aren't updated every year. Not that we necessarily need, need to do that, but you can imagine that with increasing yields and uptakes, we do need to think about um, our fertilization strategies. So that's, um, I looked at Don's, um, some of his former presentations, and I tried to present this data in the way that he did, so there would be some um, similarities. Um, so we did uh, two years of, um, and responses on uh, wheat varieties, some typical common varieties, as well as some new varieties coming out of the wheat breeding program. Santosh Kumar's program, he spoke yesterday morning <clears throat> here. And so I'll just leave it at that, that it's ongoing work, that there's a lot of variability from one year to the next. Um, new varieties tended to uh, perform as well as the more established ones. Um, I'll, as I say, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so this is uh, a study we're hosting two sites. It's led by uh, Mervyn St. Luce in Swift Current and Baulu Ma, who's in Ottawa, funded by the Canola Council, um, looking at trying to understand nitrogen cycling for canola. So there's two studies there. There's one on rate, timing, uh, and, and uh, hybrid. And there's another one, so that's this one. The other one is on uh, nitrogen rate and rotation, so uh, different frequencies of canola in a four-year rotation. <coughs> there are seven sites. I'm just presenting data from our uh, specific site here at, at the Phillips Farm north of uh, the Brandon Research Center. So um, keep your eyes up for that one. It'll be, I'm sure, published on the Canola Council website when they're finished aggregating all the seven sites across the prairies and in Ottawa for uh, updated nitrogen recommendations for canola. So um, I'm surprised Don didn't talk about phosphorus, his favorite uh, nutrient. So 2019 was the 350th anniversary of the discovery of phosphorus. Doesn't that, uh, isn't that incredible? So let's think about how important it is. This is a cartoon from the International Plant Nutrition Institute. For some reason, they um, 
they published cartoons for grade school kids to try and teach them about, there's one for nitrogen, there's one for phosphorus, there's one for potassium, I believe. So this, uh, the skeleton here is saying that eating a balanced diet is our defense against illness, bad teeth, and weak bones. And that makes me think about soil health. That me makes me think about a balanced fertility program is a defense for, uh, 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 promotes good soil health. So phosphorus is also important for photosynthesis. Um, it's an energizer in food production, important in genes and chromosomes, seed germination. Um, so yeah, you get it. Phosphorus is also important. You know that, I know. Um, as the population grows, that's I believe the red line there, the world population, the, the, the uh, extraction of phosphorus from the ground also increases. But the issue is that it's a limited resource. There's only so much phosphorus that we can mine from our soils. Um, so that's really the motivation for, well, a good chunk of the motivation for being sustainable with how we're using phosphorus. Um, and of course, the other half is the water quality. I'll get to that in a second. Just really quickly, this is some data that um, uh, Henry Wilson uh, gave to me to analyze. It's um, 26 watersheds in Manitoba. Uh, we measured phosphate, nitrate, and um, uh, organic carbon in soils in these uh, small watersheds. So we measured at the upper, middle, lower, and depression slope positions. And it just shows this green is um, the amount of phosphorus in the top two inches. So you can sort of see the green bit is higher than the blue bit and a bit higher than the red bit. <clears throat> so it means that phosphorus is stratifying in the very top uh, part of our soils across the landscapes. So that's important because Some of Henry's ongoing work, and with Jane Elliott Environment Canada, shows that a pretty strong correlation between the amount of phosphorus in the top two inches and how much phosphorus is leaving that field in runoff water. So that, of course, has um, water quality implications. <clears throat> so um, not to say that agriculture is the only uh, culprit there, but we are contributing. So. Some of the, um, what we'd like to do next with this, we have a proposal out to work on um, some of the phosphorus fertilization strategies that Don talked about, um, building up, drawing down, placement of phosphorus, source, sources that um, would uh, release phosphorus more slowly. Uh, can we put phosphorus uh, a bit deeper so to protect it more from uh, erosion and, uh, and runoff, but not, of course, lose any of our um, agronomy. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try and uh, do some agronomic-focused phosphorus work and link that to um, phosphorus losses from the field. So with those two things in mind. So do I have a couple more minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay, so just, I just wanted to have two slides on this. Just, um, I think this is really cool. The most interesting for me um, <clears throat> project I'm working on is a project um, uh, led by Peter Watts and Yushu Lee from the um, uh, Malting Barley Technical Center in Winnipeg and Anna Badea, who is our barley breeder here in, in Brandon. And so what they did, set up a project uh, at four sites across the prairies. They grew uh, seven varieties of barley and then they made beer from those uh, they malted it and they made beer <clears throat> i said to them well okay so you're going to uh, make beer from barley grown at different places is there a difference between that barley is it the same um and so what we what that's what i wanted to know if there was a difference does the uh does place make a difference for the uh, nutrient uptakes so this is just one example um we measured as many nutrients as we, as we could, to be honest with you, but I was told that uh, zinc plays an important role um, in the fermentation. So there's a, this is a pretty strong relationship with the amount of, uh, we didn't apply anything, this is just zinc that was in the soil, a pretty strong relationship with how much zinc came out. And it's not, it doesn't increase, right? It doesn't, more zinc in the soil didn't mean more zinc in the seed. But if you'll see, I hope you can see this, um, this, the, the locations, the colors are the locations, and they grouped really strongly. So where the barley was grown uh, determined to some extent how much of the zinc was being uptaken. 
So this is, um, we're applying for more money to explore this relationship further, why this is. <coughs> but, um, and so here's a photo of the, uh, the beer tasting from the first year. I tried my best to get on the panel. They said it was biased and they wouldn't let me uh, drink any beer. But so this is uh, a fascinating example of what we can do um, with our soil fertility work, linking it to, to food quality. So <clears throat> what does it mean in the end how our management influences food, which is, of course, the end goal? Uh, okay, so some takeaways, the soil health takeaways. Um, if anybody tells you they uh, know everything about soil health, don't believe them. They don't. It's very complex. Um, what I want you to take away is that um, there are uh, physical, chemical, and biological components, and whatever you're doing management-wise, whatever you're changing management-wise management -wise is going to shift those back and forth. So keep the, the entirety of that in mind um, as you move forward. So um, field shapes and um, overlapping areas uh, are keeping more nutrients, so perhaps we can uh, do a better job of managing those areas. I think that our, as uh, new varieties, our genetics are improving, so too should our soil fertility recommendations. <clears throat> and the last thing that phosphorus is uh, precious because it's uh, finite uh, and it's important for human and plant health, but it's also pro problematic when it gets into our water. So let's um, conserve it and keep it in the soil to put it in our plants. Thanks.